<laughs> hey again. <laughs> I, you know, I think it actually makes more sense for you to explain why they should, and then I'll just dispute that. Right? Um, all right. So there's really two things, and I talked about this briefly on Facebook. Um, what's your clarification for what this question actually is? Um, do you mean they have to pay a higher tax rate? Um, so, for instance, you know, right now they pay, well, the conservative, the Republican tax plan just passed. So I, I think it's like they pay like a 20 percent rate, whereas everybody else it like shifts slightly. Um, is the claim that you're making they should pay the same rate as everybody else? Or is the claim that you are making that they should pay the exact same amount as everybody else? No, my, my view is that the government has enough money and they do not require any more tax revenue at all. OK, um, I, I guess I'll respond to that. And you, I, I still don't feel like you're answering my question entirely. Um, so like, if you can answer that at a later time, but I'll address that first. Um, any form of tax cuts is going to you know, create a deficit. The government is operating at maximum capacity. The notion that we don't need any more money and that you know, we're taking in more money than we're actually spending is just wrong. In fact, we're spending more money than we're actually taking in. Um, right. whether, or not we can, you know, whether or not we can change that is a different matter altogether. So but the notion, say what? Matter at all. It's central. To okay, fine. We, we, we can talk about that in a second. But as of right now, uh, the government is currently spending more money than they're taking in. So the claim that you are making is that the government doesn't need to take this money. Well, where else are you going to get it from? The middle class or the lower class? Uh, there is no world in which the rich pays the exact same amount as the middle and lower class. The rich are going to have to pay more on you know, different percentage rates, they're going to have to pay more because of the fact that they earn more money. Um, it's not like everybody pays $10 because that's not fair to the lower brackets. Um, you know, they, they're going to have to pay more, um, even on a flat tax rate. If you tax everybody 12% of their income, the rich are going to have to be paying more money than all of the lower income brackets. So I don't really see a world where the rich have to pay the exact same amount. Right, um, but so with that, I'll pass it back to you. As I said, that's not my argument. My argument is that the government has plenty of money and it's simply wasting it. So no more money is actually needed. I mean, would you like okay. to defend the position that the U.S. government doesn't have enough money? No, I wouldn't like to defend that position, but I have a question for you. If you say that the government is spending you know, too much money, where do you think that they should cut wasteful spending? What departments should they cut? And if so, how essential are those departments? Off the top of my head, the military. You think we should cut military spending? What's military spending? Hold on, let me look at what military spending is is at right now. Um, can you give me a reason for why we should cut military spending? Well, Other we, than just they're taking a lot of money? We outspend the next 10 countries combined, most of them being our allies. Um, I can right. give you clear-cut examples of wasteful, uh, objectively wasteful in a way that you would agree with me is absolutely a waste. Um, and okay. so we know that the... Okay. The U.S. government doesn't actually have a revenue problem. I want to make that clear. The problem right. is actually spending, and you're trying to like yeah. separate the two as if they're not related. But they're actually related in, in every way. Like, if the government didn't have a spending problem, they wouldn't need to raise more taxes. But they do. No, have but they, they aren't related entirely. That's that's the issue. I don't think that, that, that again. That's why I said it's a debate for another time because revenue and spending are two in are two entirely different line items on the government's budget. Um, looking at the military budget as a whole, um, let me find out. Hold on, what is their exact? Let's say seven hundred billion ballpark. Seven hundred billion dollars. Okay. Let's just say. That. So, so obviously we aren't slashing all of that because we still need, you know, military budget. How much of that would you propose that we slash? Uh, in the first year, fifty percent. Uh, in the first, okay, we're slashing fifty percent of the budget. They won. Um, hold on. Just off of the top of my head, I feel like that, that overall, you know, overall, that that cost still isn't going to be able to be borne by the middle class and lower taxpayers. Right, you want I, to lower yeah. rates on the upper class. It's just, you know, with the Republican tax plan that was literally just passed, this is about as close as we're going to get to the lowest rates in the upper class. The upper class are going to have to pay more. Um, and, and that's what the question is about. You can talk about how we're spending more money than we need to all that you all, 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 all you want. But the nature of taxes and the way, you know, even a flat tax works, the rich have to pay more. It's not like everybody pays $10,000. That doesn't happen. That's not fair. But I've already clarified that I, that's not. No, 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 no. I'm saying that your clarification still, it still doesn't disprove what I'm saying. You, the claim that you are making, hold on, let me back, let me take a step back for a second. The claim that you are making is that the government spends more money than they actually take in. And your solution to that is by saying that the rich shouldn't pay more money. 
by slashing things that currently the government needs, right? What? They shouldn't pay more than they already are because they're already paying all the taxes, first of all, right? Okay, right, yeah. So, okay. Um, uh, 45% of Americans don't pay any taxes, any federal income taxes. So right. they're already paying all the taxes. And that people say, like, oh, well, you know, the poor uh, aren't getting a tax cut. Well, no shit. They're not paying taxes in the first place. You can't get a tax cut if you're not paying taxes. Right. Um, I'm going to look at the military thing for a second. Non <laughs> what should what percentage of the tax cut should the non taxpayers get? Like I, I don't understand how that works. What? Sorry, I misunderstood. So that. the non taxpayers should they get more of a tax cut or like I don't I don't get it because they're not they're already not paying income taxes. So like would you I don't know increase that or like what would you say about that? One second. No, my my stance is that the current tax rate right now is is, is just fine the way it is. You know, I don't think we should lower it on the upper bracket. I don't think that we should, you know, lower it on the, uh, excuse me, um, raise it on the middle class or lower class. I think that the notion that the rich should be paying, you know, a fair amount to the lower and middle classes is just wrong. Um, the upper class are always going to pay more. And as the economy expands, then that tax rate will have to expand as well. As the government starts to need more things, that tax rate is going to have to expand as well. By slashing military spending by 50%, um, I still need to figure out exactly. I haven't done that much research on the military budget as a whole, um, but I would guess off the top of my head that that would do some pretty bad things to the military. Um, what, what you know, there's likely a reason why military spending is at the way it is right now. Um, it's not like just slash 50% of it and nothing happens. You know, there's likely a reason why military spending is the way it is right now. Uh, well, it's obvious to me because that's what Congress wants to spend it on. And, you know, there's a lot of special interest groups which keep the spending so high. Um, and there's a lot of irrational voters who are completely unaware of how much is actually being wasted. Like I served in the military, so I actually know how the bureaucracy works. And I, if the taxpayers had any idea how much fucking money we were wasting on pointless things, I mean, they, they'd probably be in revolt because like every single drill that I went to was a complete waste. There was basically no reason for any of us to be there at all, but we did it anyways. Um, to give you a okay. clear-cut example, um, Congress has been, for over a decade now, building tanks that the Army specifically said they don't want, they have no need for whatsoever, and they have no use for them. But Congress uh, disagrees with, with the generals in the Army, and they say, no, you do need tanks. And what's happening is they're going straight uh, from the factory into a tank graveyard. Now, would you agree that this is wasteful? Um, well, I haven't done that much research on, on the, on the tank specifically. Um, but you know, on face that, that seems likely, um, you know, not a good thing, but I'd still bring up the point that, you know, slashing 50% of the military budget is, isn't just, you know, not producing these tanks. There's going to be a lot of things that are necessary that have to be sacrificed in the instance like what? of doing this. Like what? Like for um, well, I'm still trying to look at the, you know, the overall military budget as a whole. So give me one second. Um, but from what I saw briefly, it looks like that about 60% of the military's budget goes to, you know, keeping military bases active. So, you know, if you slash everything else to, like, get rid of the other 40%, then you have to slash 10% of military bases. Obviously, you know, that's not going to happen. It's going to come, like, 5% from here, 5% from here, uh, or a little bit across the board. But, you know, there are going to be things that are sacrificed that we don't need to sacrifice. Wait, no. Why do we need those bases? Uh, you know, for the safety and well-being of our country. There's, you know, military bases are, are mandated. We have to maintain uh, ma maintain a military force that is, you know, up to standard and, uh, and up to par. And by taking military bases away and, and not allowing them to have places where they can, you know, train and do things, that's overall not a good thing. So who are we defending Germany from right now? In your what? Who are okay, we it's, it's not so much that we're defending Germany for, for, per se. It's that there's areas in the world where we need to have troops that are willing, that are able to mobilize in an instant, uh, uh, or or missile silos, or places that we can put anti-aircraft defenses that you know have to be willing to that have to be able to to be used and have to be active. It's not so much that we're defending against you know Nazis back in the 1940s. It's it's more that we have to be prepared and ready to account for anything. And by slashing 50% of the military's budget, which honestly I don't think that this would make up for 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 the notion that we want to lower taxes on the rich necessarily. But by slashing 50% of the military budget, it's not just going to take away a couple military bases. Take away a lot of things. 
So, like, where, what are these threats? Who, who's threatening us, and why do we have to spend seven hundred billion to protect against these alleged threats? That, to me, okay, they well, see- I'll just direct you to a lot of people, uh, a lot of countries that pose an imminent threat to the United States. You never know when North Korea is going to try and you know lob a nuke at us or one of our allies. And if we don't have these military bases with anti-aircraft defenses in them, and if we don't have people that are willing to mobilize against potential threats, then th- that's not overall a good thing. Again, why would North Korea launch a nuke at the United States? In your view, um, because they've said they want to do it multiple times. Right. So if we invade North Korea, they are going to retaliate, right? Well, I never said anything about invading North Korea. They've said they wanted to obliterate the United States, regardless of if we invade them or not. Right. But they have, and, and it's not just North Korea. There could be anything that happens. Like, like it's 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 on the chance that there is something bad that happens that could be detrimental to the United States and our allies. Okay. Currently. You know, there isn't that much that that poses an, an overall threat, if that makes sense. Like, you know, Russia's a little shady. North Korea poses a pretty significant threat, but we're not in any danger of being invaded by them. Right. We might be in a little bit of danger from being bombed by them. But, you know, what if, you know, Russia tries to mobilize and we don't have a military base? Right. It, 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 it comes down to the what if questions of what if something arises and something bad happens. Slashing the military budget by 50% takes away our ability to defend against that what if. Yeah, but what if Canada invades America? Like, why shouldn't we just be stationing troops what? on the border? Yeah, what if... Uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure that... Okay, okay. No, no, no. That's two completely different okay. things. Because one, we have a lot of places here and a lot of areas here where, you know, the United States military is, is stationed right here. Like, so this notion that, like, Canada is going to invade us and we're going to be completely decimated if we aren't putting troops along the border is just wrong. It's different if, you know, there's a remote post in Germany where or where if they, you know, Russia decides to invade Germany again or, or something. I know um, that's a retarded view. That's not going to happen. Just like Canada is right. not going to invade America. Okay, but it's it's still, it, it's fundamentally different because one is homeland and one is like, you know, one military base a long, time, a, a long way away. And if that isn't there and, you know, Russia decides to, uh, I keep using Russia, or some... I don't know, well, Kazakhstan decides to, to mobilize against against our allies. We have no way of defending them and no way of fulfilling our treaties in, in, in a quick and, and responsive way. Can you explain to me? What? Can you explain? Okay, no, that's why I changed it from Russia. Again, it's not so much that that it's happening right now. And I said this earlier. It's not so much that there is, you know, Russia really wants to invade Germany right now. I don't think any country in the world uh, really wants to invade anybody else. And invade is also the wrong word. It's not like... Well, what if Russia wants to, like, you know, attack somebody? They've, they've tried it before. They mobilized against Crimea in, in Ukraine. If, <laughs> if our allies get attacked, if our allies start, you know, to pose an imminent threat and we don't have these bases in, in place to protect uh, our allies, then that's, you know, we're not fulfilling our treaties, which is stated multiple times by the Constitution and by, you know, our laws that, you know, the treaties are, some, are the most important thing that we have to fulfill. Oh, and if we don't have these in place, then it's Because NATO was formed for a completely different purpose that no longer exists. So why should there be a NATO? And who who is NATO uh, protecting us from? Because the last thing NATO did was bomb Libya. And I'm wondering which NATO country um, was threatened by Libya and why NATO is needed in the first place. Okay, I, I'm not going to get too much into NATO because I don't feel as if that overall affects that in that much of a way. Um, I'd like to go into the military's yeah, budget specifically. I also feel like the discussion in the military. What? On, you were talking about our allies, so NATO is... Yeah, I was. Up- but that's completely getting away from, from the taxes. We're talking about taxes to begin with, and we started talking about the military. Oh my God, you're <laughs> talking about treaties. You're talking about the Constitution. Treaties, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Yeah. NATO. Yeah, it's, okay. it's not just NATO that binds us to protect our allies. There are treaties that we have signed individually with other right. nations that obligate us to protect them. Let's, let's talk about that. Why should there be a NATO? Okay, again, I feel like that that's kind of straying away from what I'm saying. I don't, um, I, I feel, you can like lean back in your chair all that you want, but that's completely going against what I'm saying. You're not listening to what I'm actually saying. <laughs> we sign treaties with other nations. I'm not talking about NATO at all. I'm not, okay? I'm not talking about NATO. The United States signs a treaty with with Great Britain that says we want to defend them if they get attacked. That's completely separate from NATO. Sure, sure, we have to follow NATO in a sense, um, but I'm not talking about NATO so entirely. I'm talking about something the, the logic of that treaty or the logic of why should we have these entangling alliances in the first place, right? That's above free okay. or 
I'm sorry, your, your microphone cut out at the end of your, oh, your, your question. We're not allowed to question the utility of these entangling alliances and these treaties, right? Is that above repro reproach? Because you see, no, 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 you can question treaties that I'm talking about, but I don't want you to bring up something that I never even mentioned until you brought it up. I wasn't even talking about it when you brought it up. Hang on a second, because you're talking about we, we need these bases to defend our allies, you know, in general. Okay, right. why, are, why do we have to defend our allies? Who are our allies? Who are we defending them from? And why do we have to defend them? Okay, uh, there's a lot to unpack inside of that question. So I'll get to that 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 very briefly here. Okay, so there are treaties that we sign. Uh, don't talk. Don't don't talk about NATO. There are treaties that we sign outside of you know the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. There are treaties that we sign individually with nations that we have to follow. So we go to Britain and like, hey, if we get attacked, you defend us. And we go to Britain and say, hey, if you get attacked, we'll defend you. That's how you know a, a treaty with a nation works. That's what allies are there for. Um, you know, the reason we sign those is that in case we get attacked or in case they get attacked, we have to go defend them. I feel like the purpose behind treaties is fairly self-explanatory. Um, NATO is another discussion that could probably take up another 45 minutes. Um, we might have the same opinions on NATO. I personally think NATO shouldn't be a thing. But as for treaties that you know exist, uh, as of right now, uh, outside of NATO, which, you know, is iffy, um, uh, for, as of treaties, we have to follow those. And and as as for NATO, technically, that is a treaty that we have right now that we have to follow. So unless we want to break, well, why are you shaking your head? Why don't we have to follow NATO? We have NATO? to follow if you withdraw from it. Okay, okay, that's, again, this is what I'm talking about. That's getting into a separate discussion. As of right now, we have to follow those treaties right <laughs> no and that's what the status quo is in right now that's like saying, as of right now we follow the treaty i have to wear this shirt because i bought it no the fuck i don't i don't have to wear this shirt you know i can choose not to wear this shirt like you don't okay i feel like that's a, a, a honestly a really bad analogy for what i'm talking about a better analogy would be i have to own this shirt because i bought it the, the treaty you know in all likelihood you are going to own it do you have hmm? to have that treaty no you don't have to have that treaty but we have it right now, so we have to follow it. But what if we just don't? What if we just withdraw from the treaty? Again, that's that's what I'm saying. That's not how it is right now. We can have a discussion at a later date that's for whether or not we should withdraw from NATO. So I think I personally, our opinions on this are the exact same. I think both of us agree that we should withdraw from NATO. But as of right now, we must follow that treaty. Otherwise, we risk infringing upon international law and our own laws in our own country. That's a tautology. All right. I'm saying I'm questioning the logic of that treaty. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. A tautology is a statement that is true by logical structure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So what, what you're basically saying that what I just said is true by logical no, structure based on the way that you're wording it. You're saying we have to do this because this law exists. OK, I'm questioning that. Exactly. Law. So, OK, that's fine. And you can question that. But what I'm saying and, and I, I think you're doing more arguing than actually, you know, listening to what I'm saying. No, we can discuss if, if we want to repeal NATO, that's fine. We don't have to follow it. But in the status quo, these are the laws that we have to follow. We can't just pick and choose the laws that we have agreed to in the past just because we want to pick and choose and just because they aren't beneficial to us right now. That's not how the world works. The that's, law if countries were allowed to do that, then say, for instance, we start getting bombed, then why doesn't every other country just abandon our treaties with us because they don't want to follow us? That's not how treaties work. That's not how the real world works. The way the world works right now is that we have to defend our allies. If they come under siege, we have to be in a position to be able to defend them. The law and by just by saying that, oh, it's bad, we can't, we can't defend them because it's spending so much money it, it is not intelligent, right? It's, it's not something that we should be doing. The law itself is the very subject in dispute. What you are saying is the logical equivalent of saying, look, Congress passed a law saying we have we, that we're going to spend $700 billion. Therefore, we have to spend $700 billion. No shit. That's the very thing yeah. that I am questioning. That's the subject here. That's the dispute. The law. <laughs> I really don't understand why, why you're arguing with me because I feel like you're saying exactly what I'm saying. And I feel like you're sort of conceding to what I'm saying. <laughs> Look, you're saying that we have to do this because we have the treaty. And I'm saying exactly. we don't have to have the treaty, right? So the logical equivalent right. of saying, well, we have to spend $700 billion beca because Congress passed that law. No shit. That's the thing I'm saying we shouldn't be doing. That's the whole point of this discussion. 
Okay. I mean, you are saying something that's true by definition, but that's stupid because that very thing that you're talking about is the thing that I'm disputing. So, yeah, no, right. it's the case that if Congress passes a law saying that we're going to do something, we have to do that. But I'm talking about the law okay. itself. That's the subject of our dispute, right? Okay. Yeah. The treaties um, are allies. I don't think we should be allies. All right. This is where. I, I still think we're getting a little bit of confusion. I'll take a step back. I was getting a little bit heated back there. I'll try to, um, you know, put this to bed. And then after I say this, I'll move into other parts of the military budget. I feel like we've kind of moved away from taxes as a whole, um, which is okay. Like, you know, this wasn't really a debate per se. Um, but what I am saying is that we cannot just, you know, say that rich people shouldn't pay lower taxes because in the future we might want to repeal NATO or get rid of some of our treaties, right? The reason that the wealthy have to pay higher taxes as of right now is because of the fact that we have obligations to other countries and treaties with other places that we have to fulfill. If we slash the military budget by 50 percent, then that takes away a lot of our ability to be able to mobilize against a threat. That's good. You don't. That's good. I, I support. I think it's I good that we, removing the ability of our government to start wars. I support that. That's a good. Okay, I'm not saying starting war. If there is an imminent threat to our allies or our own well-being, but there isn't one that could spring up. At, that you, you know the world. Uh, it, you, know. you said that you served. You know that there are threats that come. You know, no, almost no. out of nowhere that Imaginary appear and complete very quickly. Threats. Sorry, your microphone keeps cutting out. Say what you said again. Imaginary and completely exaggerated threats. Okay, so look at the example of, I guess, ISIS or. Um, no, something you know, created, or, or Al Qaeda. We, we, we okay, created, fine. So. But you would agree that ISIS started spreading very rapidly, right? Right, because it started to yeah, come up very quickly. At w because of our military spending, which allows this situation to be created in the first place. So go on. Okay, but that that, that that's sort of you know hearsay. Not no, hearsay. No, no, it's, it, it's neither it, here it, nor there. It's a okay. Okay. Do you, do you believe, do you honestly believe that an organization calling itself the Islamic State of Iraq would exist under Saddam's regime? Do you believe that's okay. what you think? Probably not. I don't dispute. Hold on. No, no, no. I don't dispute that the government may or may not have. I haven't done that much research on it. But from what I've heard, it sounds like it's true, right? Okay. That's neither here nor there. Oh, it, I sort of, I lost my train of thought because you started bringing up government uh, trading ice. Okay. We, we did. The claim that I made, Regime. and the idea behind me bringing, hold on, hold on, pause for a second. The idea behind me bringing up ISIS was to show that military threats can come out of nowhere, you know, Al-Qaeda or, or ISIS. And if we are not financially pre or, or, or financially prepared to meet those threats, then we stand the chance of, of getting into a disaster like, like we have in the past. Nowhere. ISIS is a direct product of our military spending. If we didn't do the regime change thing in Iraq, there simply wouldn't be an ISIS. So the creation of ISIS is a direct product of this military spending. It wouldn't even okay. exist. So we created that problem. So you can't use that as an example for, okay, we need to defend against the problems that we create? Right. No, 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 no. Uh, okay. Um, I, again, I feel like this is kind of getting away from from you know the the topic of taxes to begin with. So I'll I'll ask a question to you more specifically. Mm -hmm. You said that you wanted to slash fifty percent of the military's budget, which, if I'm not mistaken, would make about um, how much was the total? Is it two hundred billion that they it's spend? To where we were at before nine eleven, which, by the way, that amount did nothing to stop uh, nine eleven at all. Okay, so so you want to take the military budget back to what it was? Uh, do you have numbers on what that military I take budget it was? Lower than that. Like eventually, I'd like to get it down to like ten percent of current spending. Okay. Um, can you start with the fifty percent instead of just saying we'll slash fifty percent of the budget because that's not how real Congress works? Can you point me in exact places where you would slash? Uh, so anything do to do with the Middle East. So no troops in the Middle East. Full withdrawal. Same with Europe. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. My, this sort of, again, we're going to probably start to get away from taxes. The reason why we can't do that, um, you know that we take a lot of oil away from the Middle East, right? Yeah. Okay. If we allow that region to become destabilized again and don't maintain a military presence over there, uh, de-incentivizing people from, from moving into that area, 
that's going to do terrible things to you know us will being able to control uh, not control oil us being able to purchase oil. You know, we started to withdraw with withdraw troops around I think it was 2013, right? Um, from uh, from the Middle East, and that's when the start of ISIS began. You know, you can talk a lot. So it, it was it was in part it was in part because of of you know the government sort of funding them, I guess. I haven't looked that much into it, but this is what I've heard from a lot of people. So it was in part because of that. But I would say that in a main part, it had a lot to do with the fact that we were withdrawing soldiers and they were de-incentivized and they were incentivized that, hey, this is our time to act. They're taking military troops out. And what's to say that another group like that won't happen, won't happen again? You know, we destabilized Al-Qaeda. We stopped them. Uh, it, I think, what was before? It was like Hezbollah before that. Like, Every time you get rid of one of these militant groups against uh, in the Middle East, a new one rises up. So by saying that, oh, it's pretty stable right now, we should withdraw troops. That's just uh, th another one's going to you know come up, we which are, threatens our ability to purchase oil. We are in fact the main destabilizing force in the Middle East. That must be made clear because, as I already stated, there would be no such thing as ISIS if we did not overthrow Saddam's regime. Saddam simply would have okay. killed them off before they ever had a chance to exist. So we, right. ISIS is a direct product of this military largesse that you support, right? Because if we, they didn't right. have all this money to be wasting on these pointless wars, they couldn't overthrow Saddam's regime, and he would simply still be in power. Same with Gaddafi in Libya. Right now, you can purchase a slave for $700 in Libya. That didn't used to be the case when Gaddafi was in charge, right? They went from having the highest standard of living in Africa to one of the lowest, based simply purely on our actions there, along with you know our our allies, our NATO allies in Europe, uh, who who also helped rape Libya. So okay. we are in fact the main destabilizing force in the Middle East. So it doesn't make sense for you to say, okay, well we we need to keep troops there to uh, to restabilize the destabilization we we created. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. You're looking back at past actions of the United States. You know, obviously hindsight is 2020. If we could go back and change that, we would. But this is the world we live in right now. Okay? We can't change past actions of the US government by saying that this is the world we live in right now is that if we take troops out of the Middle East, there is absolutely nothing stopping another militant group from rising up again. We have ISIS on their heels right now because of the fact that we've started, you know, uh, we, we've unleashed the military, per se, onto ISIS. We have ISIS on their heels. Hmm. Sorry, what? Is that what happened in your in your imagination? Is that what you think? No, that's what's happening in reality. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, we oh beat ISIS in Syria. Is that your claim? I'm not... Wait, hold on. You say we beat ISIS in Syria? Did we defeat ISIS in Syria? Because I'm pretty sure that was the Syrian and Russian governments which did that. But you would... Uh, uh, um... I, I think that we haven't defeated it per se, but in the coalition with other countries, again, looking at our allies, in coalition with other countries, we have ISIS on their heels right now. Okay. Oh, that's that's an but indisputable fact. Keeping in mind that ISIS didn't exist before we decided on the regime. Okay, again, that's looking at past actions of the U.S. government. Right. We shouldn't okay. lower taxes that's on the rich. Directly. It, it, we can't lower taxes on the rich in the past. We have to keep them the way they are right now simply off of the fact that this is the world we live in right now. Obviously, if we could go back in the past and change everything, but you, we, we, we probably would. However, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, pause for a second. However, this goes back to the treaty thing again. This is the world we live in right now. You can talk about future changes, but you can't say that we should we should change things in the past. That's not humanly possible. That's not how a discussion should happen. I didn't say The that. world we live in right now is that if we withdraw troops from the Middle East, then it's it's going to open the door for another militant group to rise again. Um, where's the evidence uh, for that? What? Yeah, where's the evidence for it is when we when when we withdrew troops from the Middle East. That's the evidence for that. When did we withdraw troops from the Middle East? Bro President Obama started withdrawing troops from the Middle East from I think it was uh, his second year in office. He started withdrawing troops, and that's when the rise of ISIS happened. Okay, that's how it happened in your view. Okay. So no, that's how it happened in reality. It was a combination of us subsidizing them through through you know little side deals, selling them. Um, um, different things from here and there, and paired with the fact that we were taking military, uh, taking our soldiers out of the Middle East, it led to the rise of ISIS. So actually, what really happened is that we're financing a regime change war in Syria, 
Uh, we were funding and training and arming terrorists, the CIA, the CIA was. And this actually conflicted with the Pentagon's wars. And what ended up happening is that the Pentagon and the CIA were essentially fighting a proxy war against each other. Which is okay. more evidence that our government has too much fucking money and they're wasting it on stupid shit that's creating problems for all of us in society and making life very miserable for people in the Middle East because we're doing things like creating ISIS, uh, creating slavery in Libya. These are objectively bad things, and it's a product of our military largesse. If the government didn't have this money to be wasting, they wouldn't be doing it. Okay. Um, looking back on the you know financial side of, of that, taking people out of the Middle East wouldn't be a slash of 50%. It wouldn't even come, excuse me, wouldn't even come close. Uh, removing all operations from the Middle East, like literally everything, like you said, which again, I think is a not a great thing, removing literally everything from the Middle East, um, all US involvement completely, like every influence that we have on that region. Okay, um, Wouldn't even make it 50%. Where else would you want to slash the budget? What would happen if China withdrew from the Middle East? Does China currently have troops in the Middle East? Exactly my point. So China buys oil, China is going to be okay. the largest oil consumer rather soon. Um, and it doesn't seem to require Chinese troops in the Middle East. Okay. I mean, how do you explain that? Two things. One, um, unless I'm mistaken, China isn't direct enemies of a lot of countries in the Middle East, right? So even if these militant groups took over, even if these militant groups took over, they would pose no threat to, to their oil sales. In fact, you know, ISIS, I would argue that ISIS was probably selling a lot of their oil to China. Because, you know, China's pretty, pretty neutral. They, they don't really have enemies in the Middle East. However, this, again, goes back to how we can't change things that happened in the past. The United States all have enemies in the Middle East because of our past actions, right? And so to say that we should completely withdraw and allow these countries that don't like us or these militant groups that really don't like us to potentially take over the oil routes and, and take away our ability to purchase oil well, is not intelligent. That. You're asserting that ISIS is going gonna, is gonna to take over Saudi Arabia or iraq they were on the brink of doing it but they were on the brink of, of, of moving into these areas there's not a whole lot of evidence to support that theory what's actually happening is that when we destabilize certain countries such as libya syria iraq when we overthrow okay. these regimes then that's when isis comes springs into action out of nothing question can you provide the link for me for how u.s military involvement directly links to destabilization Yes, because there are a lot of okay. times that other troops exist in countries where they don't destabilize yeah. those countries. I'm not saying example. that we need to control the whole regime. I'm saying we need to have, you know, boots in the ground in case these tr these countries decide to, you know, make a play at the oil routes. I'll give you two great, clear cut, obvious, concrete examples. Do you believe Fine. that it would be possible to buy a slave in Libya for seven hundred dollars if we did not overthrow Gaddafi? Uh, I don't know, but assuming no, based no, on your I, question, I'd say probably yeah. That, you, you couldn't do that under Gaddafi. Okay. So that wasn't a thing before. Now it's a thing. Okay, hold on. No, no, no. I can see where you're going with this. Hold on. Pause for a second. My question wasn't related to what happens when the United States decides to get into regime change. Regime change. My question was what happens when the United States simply has a military force active, not when they're trying to control a regime change, but when they have a military force active in those countries. Does that yeah. destabilize? So what happens is you 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 have a slave market in Libya. That's one example of what can happen. When, when we have a hold up, no 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 no. How does having U.S. Can, can you show me the length of how having U.S. soldiers active leads to a slave market? Because that doesn't happen in literally every other. That happens in no other country. Where's the link for when that happens when the United States soldiers yeah, are in there? So I just told you under Gaddafi that wasn't a thing. We removed Gaddafi from power. We bombed Libya, and now it's a thing. So uh, same with Iraq. There was no such thing as ISIS under Saddam, and I've not seen anyone try to argue that you know some organization calling itself the Islamic State of Iraq would somehow come to power under Saddam's regime and claim large swaths of territory. And Saddam, I ostensibly would be completely fine with this and say, okay, fine. Okay. We're the Islamic State. We're Iraq. We're, we're the Bathist party. You guys stay over there. Bullshit. It would have fucking killed them right off the bat, and there wouldn't be an ISIS. So the fact that we've 
changed these regimes and the fact that we are meddling so much in the Middle East is directly responsible for the problems which you are saying that we need to we need the military to be there in the first place. So what you are arguing, whether you're aware of this or not, is that we need the military to fix the problems created by the military. OK. You sh again, this is OK. This has been a lot of the issue that we've had inside of this discussion. Um, is that I ask you a question and you answer with either something you've already responded with that I've responded to, or you just don't answer it. You really didn't answer my question there. And you sort of pointed that out because, okay, you said that, you know, we bombed Gaddafi. That's the distinction. You said we bombed them. I'm not saying that we should bomb the Middle East. I am saying that we should have boots in the ground, just exist and be a presence. And, and in case, you know, something happens, then we have the ability to do something. Okay, but I'm not saying we problem. should just straight up bomb them. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> the ability to do something is, in fact, the destabilizing force. That is the okay. You, again, again, again. You have not shown me the link. Why that? The link. Why that's a thing. I just did the link that I, you I, showed. I no, you didn't. Iraq because what? You, okay, your link was saying that. Okay, we have boots in the ground. They bombed them. That leads to destabilization. Okay, you haven't shown where boots in the ground without the bombing leads to destabilization. What is, you haven't shown that. Hang on a second. What is this arbitrary distinction about boots on the ground? We're talking about military spending in general. So right. That's a yes, I agree. arbitrary distinction. No, 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 no. Okay, here's how the succession came to where it was right now. We started talking about how much of the U.S. military budget we should cut. And you said, you started off, which again, I don't think that that would come close to even, even scratching the surface of 50%. You started talking about how we should slash everything to do with the Middle East, like completely remove ourselves from the Middle East. Then we started talking talking about, you know, why we can't do that. Uh, I said, why we can't remove ourselves completely from the Middle East. You responded with the idea that, you know, the government caused this problem. Um, and then I asked for the link that why a military base existing in the Middle East would cause this problem. And then you came back with the link, link that when a military base exists and they start trying to interfere with the government, like, you know, bombing and, 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 and you know, military operations against that country, that leads to destabilization. Mm -hmm. You still haven't shown the link of how a military uh, how a military base or military operations without taking military action against the government leads to destabilization. <laughs> right, In wait. fact, every empirical example of literally every other military base across the entire world where they don't take military action against that government <laughs> is empirically proven to show what I am saying. That, but just by having boots in the ground without them doing anything, just existing to be able to respond to a potential threat, doesn't necessarily lead to destabilization. You're, you're compartmentalizing information, and it's really bizarre. I'm saying that when you have a base there, that is going to lead to you using it for these purposes, which it does, of course. We know that. We, that's why China hasn't changed any regimes in the Middle East. Guess what? They don't have any fucking bases in the Middle East, so of course they haven't done okay. any regime change. Okay, so you're saying, that, well, forgive me if I'm wrong, but what you literally just said is that when you have a base in the Middle East, you automatically have to use it. Not automatically. I'd like to turn that back on you. I'd, hold on. I'd like to turn that back on you and bring up the shirt analogy that you brought at the start of the round. Just because you buy a shirt doesn't mean you have to use it. I never said that, though. I never said you automatically. Had, I said, based on history, known facts, this is what actually happened. Not it automatically okay. has to happen. It did happen. Right. Okay, but here's the distinction. All involvement includes just taking, like, it's not like this is how it automatically has to work, right? It's not like you put a base there and it's out of our control. You know, for the purpose of this discussion, we're sort of, sort of, I don't want to get into like, you know, this isn't a team policy debate, so we don't have that exact rules, but we're sort of acting as the U.S. government in this discussion. What I'm saying is that we can have boots in the ground. It is physically possible to have boots in the ground without military involvement. And by saying that we should just completely slash everything to do with the Middle East and allow that region to just fend for itself and our oil lines being thrown into conflict is incredibly dangerous. Well, there's no. I'm not advocating that we should interfere with their government. I'm not advocating that we should start bombing Libya again. What I am advocating for is by keeping military installations all around the world to, you know, be able to respond to any potential threat. Yeah. Not that they have to preempt threats, but when a threat arises. We are able to respond to it quickly and effectively. There is slashing the military budget with the Middle East completely indicates our ability to do that. There is zero evidence to suggest that the U.S. military is a stabilizing force in the Middle East. Zero. There's no evidence to suggest okay. that is actually the case. That's a theory. It's a it's one theory, but it's a discredited theory because it's not consistent with reality or the facts. 
Okay, and I'll turn back again what you said earlier. The military by itself just existing empirically, looking at literally every country in the world that we have a military base on where they don't you know, involve itself in the government is a stabilizing force. For the reason why we have it there, uh, you can laugh all you want, but it's true. The reason we have military bases is to d either defend our allies or defend things that you know we want to protect, like oil lines. When the United States military, or any military for that instance, becomes a destabilization force, is when they begin to attack other countries, right? <laughs> or, or when they begin to start you know, changing regimes like you talked about. You brought this up in your own point. Uh -huh. But when the military is just there and, 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 is, and is there to protect, not necessarily to say, hey, no, 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 we're going to take this over for ourselves. But they just exist there in case, you know, an ISIS wants to come back. Uh, when I say an ISIS. A, a group like ISIS wants to come back and say, no, 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 this is our oil territory now. No, that, that's not a thing. We have somebody there that's able to respond to that threat. It's not like you put a military base there, they're going to start bombing everything in the country. That doesn't make logical sense. They're there to that's protect our interests like, domestically we, and abroad. And by slashing military spending so you can lower taxes on the rich, that's exactly what happens. But that, that the is tax rate on the rich right now is exactly where it needs to be. And by slashing the military budget by 50%, more often than not, that does bad things for our country as a whole. Well, do you have an example of that being the case? Like, do you, do you feel safer now that we've increased the budget to seven hundred billion, or like? Um, you well, I mean, I okay, I don't really have a comparison for 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 history, so I can't say that I feel safer now than I than I've ever been before. Um, but what I will say is, that looking at the budget as a whole, slashing it by fifty percent takes away our ability to do a lot of things. Yeah. And you said that you want to get it down to 10%. So taking it down by 90% is is going to take away a massive, a massive amount of our abilities to have future innovations. Bad thing. It's going to take down bad our thing. ability to yes. train our military. I want to reduce our government's ability to do bad things. I think that's objectively a good thing. We should. Okay, you don't. Okay, this is where the distinction comes. You don't have to reduce the ability to do bad things by taking away their money. Yes, you do. You can set procedures. Okay, where's the link for that? Why is that I the case? Because I can give you a great example. You that without taking if you're not money. spending money on regime change wars in the Middle East, then you won't have a regime change war in the Middle East. Do you see how that works? Okay. Yeah. Again, that's what happened in the past. Are we currently spending money on a regime change war right now? Uh, yeah, we, we're, uh, the CIA is still basically overthrowing regimes that we don't agree with. Uh, I don't know that we've actually stopped trying in Syria. Maybe we have, maybe we haven't, but we're, we certainly were trying to destabilize that regime as well. Again, this is sort of getting away from taxes. Okay. By slashing well, the U.S. military budget by 90% just so you can lower taxes on the rich. That's not the only Takes thing. away <laughs> military training. Well, that's the, what the discussion is on. But I didn't say that you're, you made a logical connection that I never made. I didn't say so that we can reduce taxes on the rich. My argument has never changed and you never addressed it. The government has enough money. They're simply wasting it on stupid shit. And giving them more money isn't going to fix that. If you have a spending problem, that's the thing that needs to be addressed. For example, if my wife goes out and starts shopping at Gucci and Prada and, and wasting all this money and that's exceeding our income. The solution is not to give her more money. I'm sorry, but the U.S. government has a spending problem, not a revenue problem. $3.8 trillion in discretionary spending is a lot of fucking money. And it would be hard for you to argue that, wait, no, that's not enough. They need more like $5 trillion, especially if we look at it on a per capita basis. Look at the population of China, for example. They have over a billion people. Then compare that to their actual budget. It's substantially less than the United States. So to me, it's absolutely crystal clear that the U.S. government does not have a revenue problem. I mean, we take in more per capita than practically every other comparable country. Um, the, the problem that our government has is a spending problem, and it can't be fixed by giving them more money. So I'll, I'll let you respond. Right. I'll agree with that. OK, I've, I've never really disputed that. But what it comes down to is you have to point to me an area where the United States can conceivably cut. That's why we started talking about the military. Yeah. You talk a lot about, oh, we have a spending problem, but how do we find that spending problem? Like, where where can we cut? You talk about the military, but that's why we had the discussion about why we can't cut the military. <laughs> you want to slash it down to 10% of its current budget? 
And that's that's just not that's not how it works. You can't just say no. We'll slash this. We'll slash this. We'll slash why, this. Why? There's things that we have to sacrifice. What? What? Who made what? the rule saying I can't say that? Like, why can't we cut? Okay, no, no, no. You can say that because obviously you just said it. But you know, it's not logically smart, and it's not economically, and it's not socially why? smart. Why though? To only have our military running on twenty billion dollars. What? Why? Okay, because of the fact that our country is, you know, it has a lot of vested interests uh, abroad. That's why we started talking about, you know, treaties. That's the way it works right now. But we have a lot of treaties China, abroad. And, and they're not, we have a lot. they don't have bases in the Middle East, so okay. I'm fine. Okay, again, that inhibits their ability to respond to threats to other countries. Good, that's great. Okay.